Hey guys, in this quick video, I'm going to share with you some tips and tricks to get the most out of your GPS unit. Now, this will work whether you use a handheld unit, a wearable, or the GPS on your smartphone. The principles that I'm going to explain to you here are all going to be the same, so it should work regardless of what type of device you want to use. If you want to dive a little bit deeper, I have an article on Hiking Guy that explains it in a little bit more depth that you might find interesting, so check that out as well. And if you're enjoying the video, if you learned something, if you think it's helpful, if you could do me a favor, if you could click the little thumbs up, it's an easy way to say thank you. All right, let's uh, dive in. Now, first off, let's just dispel a myth. A GPS does not broadcast any kind of data or signal in order to position you on Earth. If you have a phone, it might broadcast cell phone signals. If you have an inReach, it might broadcast uh, inReach signals to a satellite. But to use a GPS and get a position, you only need to receive. It does not broadcast anything. And the way it works is it's an antenna and it's something called a GPS chipset. And the GPS chipset is really the heart of a GPS receiver. What that does is it takes the signals from the uh, GPS antenna, evaluates them, and spits out a position to your operating system, whether that's on a Garmin, Android, iOS, whatever that might be, that all happens in the GPS chipset. So that's kind of the mechanics. There's no transmitting on GPS. You can put a GPS by your head. It's fine. You're not going to... Uh, you know, broadcast GPS waves into your brain. Now, technically, you only need three GPS signals in order to get your position on Earth. And that's the formula. It's a thing called trilateration. I'm not going to get into that now, but three signals from three satellites is all you need to get your position. And if you have a GPS unit, you might sometimes see a 2D position or a 3D position. If you have three satellites, you can get a 2D position, which is your latitude and longitude. If you have four satellites, you can get your 3D position, which is your latitude, longitude, and elevation. Now, the reality is you might only need three or four satellites to do that, but the more signals you have, the more choices that your GPS chipset has to evaluate. So think of it this way, if your GPS chipset is getting 10 signals, and that's data that's coming down from the satellites that your GPS unit is getting, but if it's getting 10 signals, it can pick the four best signals in terms of signal strength or data integrity. So the reality is people might say you only need three signals to get a GPS position. The more signals you have, the better. Quick note that GPS is actually only the USA's system. There are other systems, and they are collectively known as GNSS, Global Navigation Satellite Systems. All right, so is GPS better than GLONASS? Is GLONASS better than Galileo? Should you use one? Should you use all? Should you use both? All good questions. Now, I said earlier that the more signals your GPS has to choose from, the easier it is to get a quality signal. And all of those different systems, GPS, GLONASS, Galileo, they're all from different agencies, from different governments. They're, they all work on the same principles. They're a little bit different, different frequencies, different um, signal encodings. So really, if you have more signals, theoretically, your GPS will have more of a variety of signal to choose from, it can pick the best one. So the short answer is you're gonna want all of them on. Now the downside is that because they're different, the GPS chipset has to do some conversion in order to square those all up and evaluate them. So having them all on burns a little bit more battery on your device. So uh, that said, if the battery doesn't matter, put them all on. If battery matters, just go with one. Now, I'll go into detail in the article on the different systems, GPS, Galileo, and GLONASS, but if you are going to choose just one, you should just fool around with it. If you're in the States, um, GPS works pretty good. I found that Galileo is also pretty reliable. Um, it's really how reliable are the satellite constellations. Now, GPS is designed to always have four satellites above you on any point on Earth, so theoretically, you should always have a line of sight to four GPS satellites, but it's not always that way. Sometimes they go out of service, whatever it might be. So again, putting all of those options on will give your GPS unit more choices, uh, more signals to evaluate, and uh, hopefully will give you a better position. Let me just add that people get very uh, passionate about 
which one is better. This is based on my personal experience of using a GPS for thousands of hours outdoors um, and also learning about the theory behind it and behind GPS chipsets. So again, if you have one that works the best for you, go with it, love it, live it. But if you're just evaluating it, putting them all on will probably give you your best results. And if you're using GPS on your phone, if you don't have it in airplane mode, most modern phones will also use Wi-Fi signals and cellular signals, just like a GPS signal, in order to determine your position or put that into a larger calculation of your position. So next, you have to learn to live with the environmental constraints of a GNSS or GPS system. Now, the bandwidth of the signal that comes down from the satellites was designed to penetrate vegetation and a canopy, but not solid. So if you're in a canyon, like over there, you might have some trouble getting a line of sight to a satellite. There's not a lot you can do about that. The other thing that you're kind of powerless with is something called space weather. So when a GPS signal travels from a satellite down to Earth, it obviously has to go through multiple layers of the atmosphere. Um, those layers of the atmosphere are electrically charged when there's solar flares. Uh, basically what happens is the charge on those layers of the atmosphere kind of go crazy, they scatter the signal a little bit, and you can have problems. And there's actually a space weather uh, report that you can check if you want to ensure that you're going to have good GPS, you can give that a check before you head out and will tell you how disturbed the atmosphere is. Also, if you're receiving a signal from way over on the horizon, it can bend in the atmosphere. So. Not a lot you can do about those things. Uh, if you really need a solid fix and need to locate yourself, do your best to get high, get out of a canyon, and have an unobstructed uh, view to the sky. And obviously it's like easier said than done, but it's just something you have to live with. It's, it's an amazing technology. It's a signal from outer space coming down to like a watch or a phone. You know, it still does pretty good given how incredible it is. All right, as long as we're talking about satellites and satellite angles, if you have a Garmin handheld, there should be an icon called satellite. If you click into that, it will give you basically a map of the satellites in the sky that you are receiving. And if you use the arrow keys, you can cycle through whatever systems you have enabled right here. I have Galileo and GPS. The middle is directly above your head. The edge is the horizon and this line in the middle of the circle here, that middle circle is the 45 degree line. And ideally you wanna have satellites on either side of that 45 degree line or each compass point of the 45 degree line to get your best satellite fix. Down here are the satellite numbers that you have along with a signal strength. And up here is the uh, accuracy, which I'll talk about in a second. Now, if you're getting a new GPS receiver, I highly recommend going for a multi-band receiver. And the idea there is that when GPS started in 1993, there was one band, one type of signal, one standard of signal that was broadcast down from the satellites. That dates back, you know, it went live in 1993, so it was probably devised in the 80s, uh, done by the military. But since then, they've upgraded to the technology, the signal strength, and there are new bands uh, broadcasting from the newer satellites. So if you can get a multi-band receiver, it will be able to receive those new signals from the new satellites and you will get much better precision, a much better basically signal from the GPS satellite to your GPS device. So if you have multi-band, go, go with it, enable it. And a lot of new phones have multi-band as well or some of them do, not a lot, but some of them do. So if you're buying a new phone and you want good precision, look for a multi-band GNSS uh, receiver or phone. There's two simple things you can do with your GPS device before you leave for the backcountry that will help its accuracy and help its processing. First is to sync it with whatever smartphone app, if you're on Garmin, like Garmin Connect or Garmin Explore, before you go out. What that does is it downloads a file called an EPO file um, that gives basically the positions of all of the satellites. So when a satellite or a GPS or a GNSS system broadcasts uh, to your receiver, one of the things that broadcasts is it, it's an almanac. It tells the receiver where it's gonna be going so the receiver can calculate its position as it moves forward in orbit. 
but you can also get that from the internet from your sink when you sync with Garmin or something like that. So do that before you go out. It'll also update any firmware. You know, sometimes the chipsets have updates or the operating system has updates. Always good to do that before you go. The other thing to do is something called a GPS soak. And that's basically when you get out of your car at the trailhead, turn your GPS on, leave it on top of your car. Don't forget it when you leave, but let it pick up the satellites before you start tracking. Give it two to five minutes to just lock on to satellites, start doing that evaluation, get a good position. And then when you're ready to start hiking and you hit start on your track or your watch or whatever it is, it will have the best position possible. Another thing to do for better accuracy is to enable uh, WAAS, WAS, or EGNOS if your receiver has it. What those are are correction signals. So when the satellites orbit the Earth, sometimes they go a little bit off orbit, their clock might be wrong, different minor things might make the basically the data that they broadcast down incorrect. And what the WAAS, WAS, and EGNOS uh, signals are, are they are another version of a satellite system that broadcasts down to your GPS and uh, essentially has corrections for the satellite. So it, it, it's helpful because it gets you a better position, but it also drains the battery a little bit more because now it's receiving another signal and it's doing another calculation on those GPS signals. So if you're trying to maximize your battery, turn that stuff off and live with the you know, reduction in accuracy. But if your battery is fine, you can use your GPS all day on the one battery, enable those, and you will get uh, theoretically better results. Now, if you want the most accurate track, I highly recommend turning off a setting on Garmin's called Smart Recording, which basically records a track point uh, when it thinks there's been movement. So it uses things like the accelerometer, it uses um, your movement, the, the pedometer, things like that to determine whether you're moving or turning. But I found that it, it's not always accurate and sometimes I get big gaps in track points. So what I do instead is I have my recording uh, like on my Phoenix watch set to every second. Now, what you have to do is if you set it to every second, when you stop, you have to pause it. Because if you don't pause it, what it'll do is it'll do something called nesting where it starts dropping points um, where you're stopped but the problem is let's say you have 10 feet of accuracy and you're stopped somewhere for uh whatever a minute and it's recording 60 sec every second so 60 seconds it's going to do or it's going to do 60 track points in that minute that you're stopped if you have an uh an accuracy of 10 feet it could theoretically be doing those 10 feet apart so it could have 600 feet recorded as you're stopped in one place. So always remember to pause it when you stop. But uh, you know, I think that's a general uh, uh, good practice anyway, just to avoid any uh, errors on your GPS. And while we're on that topic, we can answer the question, why are GPS distances different? Um, you know, I could be walking right next to a friend. We have the same GPS device, but the measurements are different. That's because when it's recording your track, there are a lot of variables that can go in there. It can be smart recording, it can be recording every second. People could be stopping and it's still recording and popping um, track points around. So there's a lot of variables in how those track points are calculated and the overall distance in terms of, of where you've hiked and how your activity is recorded is based on the distance between each one of those track points. So usually you get a little bit of variation maybe a half a mile at most over maybe 10 miles but you know if you're stopping a lot or you're you're you know you have different recording sex, uh, settings going on it can be very different or if there's a, a dropout sometimes you get a signal dropout and you'll get one track point that's maybe like you know 500 feet away from you and then it comes back that can add a lot of distance on. So if you want to check it out, if you go back to your track afterwards on the computer and you look at it and you look for any of those points that kind of pop off uh, and delete them, you can kind of clean up your track afterwards and get a more accurate distance on your hike or run or whatever it might be. And I'll just end this by saying, as a casual hiker or biker or runner, how much accuracy do you need? You can get GPS units for surveying that cost thousands of dollars that can get you a centimeter level of precision. But if you follow these best practices and you can get, you know, 
somewhere between 8 and 12 feet of precision. That's pretty good. I think that's pretty reasonable. It can, you know, it's enough to help you navigate on the trail. It's enough to get a reasonably accurate uh, recording of your activity, and it's fine. But, you know, if you can get a multi-band receiver, get the multi-band, it'll be a little bit better. It also works in tougher conditions as well. So it works better in canyons. And I have reviews on multi-band receivers. I'll put links to those under the video as well. So you can check those out and see what the differences are specifically. But again, most consumer GPS units have enough accuracy uh, for most of us. Now, I know there's people who are competitive on Strava and want to accurately measure segments or people who do surveying. And there's some, you know, I call them edge cases or special cases. In that case, you might want to get the best you can, obviously spend a little bit more. But for most of us, just having a decent GPS will do the job and is a really valuable and helpful tool in the backcountry that I'm sure if you went back to like 1855 and you asked anybody who was in the backcountry if they could have that technology, they would all grab it regardless of how much local knowledge or, you know, environmental knowledge they might have had. So enjoy your GPS. It's a powerful tool. So that's it. Hopefully that was helpful. It was interesting. And if you want to dive deeper or learn a little bit more, remember I have an article on Hiking Guy that goes a little bit deeper, talks about some other complimentary subjects. Now, if you have any questions, again, or tips of your own, leave them in the comments and I'll do my best to address them. And uh, if you enjoyed it, if you could give me a like, I appreciate that. And guys, I will see you out there. Bye.